privilege here today that we have among us uh, Dr. Naveen Vankatari. Uh, I welcome you on behalf of uh, the whole Portal University family, uh, Dr. Naveen. Welcome you for this webinar. I take this privilege to introduce Dr. Naveen. Uh, he is currently working as a research fellow in the Department of Biochemistry and, Mol and Molecular Biology at Monash University in Melbourne. So he got his MPhil uh, in, in a collaborative kind of a thing where he got his degree of MPhil from Bilberg University, Karnataka, along with uh, uh, you know his work being distributed in Periyar University as well as Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. He obtained his PhD from uh, Taiwan and uh, later he moved on to uh, various fields to enrich his uh, knowledge and expertise. He has served even in uh, industries like he has worked in Mark Millipur as well as the Bangalore Jimmy. And his current research interest is basically on the structural and functional aspects of the viruses, including the COVID-19. He has uh, you know, uh, more than uh, 24 research awards in his name. I will I'll, I'll, I'll introduce you. I take that as one of the happiest moments to introduce about his credentials and the recognitions which have been you know fortified by the scientific uh, community as such. Majorly, his research interests are uh, basically uh, revolving around the human infection and the immunity. Very specifically, he is expertized and he has the keen interest to work on the structural and the functional proteins of the bacterial and bacteria as well as the viruses. He is expertized in X-ray crystallography, cryo-EM, the molecular dynamics, protein biochemistry, regulation of the viral RNA replications as such. He has, to his credit, uh, lots of uh, the internationally renowned publications for which he has even been uh, awarded. Just to mention very recently in the year 2020, he, uh, he was, uh, uh, his paper on the COVID as recognized as the top 10 research articles of the year 2020. And it was also recognized and awarded as the most popular, popular research article in 2020. And he was also being uh, you know, uh, bestowed with the F1000 uh, prime recommendation. And in 2008, he got the award of uh, 5S management award also. And in 2021, very recently, he has been awarded with the ASBMB Early Career Research Award also. It's really pride. It's really proud for all of us uh, uh, from the Paral University, the part of Paral University, and other people who has the keen interest to listen to your uh, you know, research very specifically about the COVID-19 as the whole world is witnessing the pandemic. And we would like to be enlightened with the research, what you have been working with, and uh, uh, we, we would like to he hear to you, Navin. Over to you, please. Thanks, Girish. Thanks for the uh, warm welcome. And uh, it's my delight. I'm very delighted and happy to present uh, first time at Paral University. Uh, it's good to know. Um, I'm not going to delay. I'll start my slides. First of all, I am not really know who are the audience. So if you uh, are... Like no, if, we, we, we have the faculty from life sciences and mm -hmm. all other faculties from uh, medical sciences also. We have right. the students from life sciences from and other applied sciences also. They all are interested. And we have, although the audience who are out of Coral University are also going to be witnessing your presentation. So it can be a great opportunity to uh, yeah. speak to the all public uh, uh, here. Sure. I'll try to talk as simple as possible to layman's language so that everyone can understand with a diverse background. Um, Is my slide is clear or? Yeah, it is. Okay. Um, as Girish has introduced, uh, today I'm going to talk about how the SARS-2 protein, especially the spike protein of the SARS-2, is going to engage the different host cell factors or the components on the host cell 
like in lung cells in basic terms, how the virus is going to utilize uh, variant uh, the host cell factors for enter into the human cells. So, and also what are the drugs can be used and what are the potential therapeutics uh, therapeutics in the sense like in a, a combination of a drugs or which we have evaluated um, in the different clinical trials. I'm going to talk about that. First and foremost, uh, um, I live in Melbourne and I'm working at Monash University. It's in the Victoria estate. It's one corner of the Australia. It's sort of a part of the one side of the world, I can say, is completely denoted. Um, it's a beautiful city indeed in Melbourne and uh, with a lot of green and um, a lot of um, a vibrant environment there. Um, especially the Monash University is one of the highly recognized infrastructure wise with respect to studying the st structure of proteins or viruses or bacteria anywhere. Um, so I highlighted here this U-shaped building is come from where I'm working in. It's called as the Biomedical Discovery Institute. It's a, a prime institute where most of the biomedical research goes. And we also have an, a, a synchrotron to solve the crystal structures of the proteins because we use an extra uh, x-rays to solve the crystal structure. And we also have a state-of-the-art EM facility uh, at the uh, our campus. We have around uh, six electron microscopes and including the uh, top one kiosk, uh, which is our most advanced one, which costs around a $12 million microscope. Um, that gives in a high resolution uh, imaging and as well as tomography. So today I'm going to talk about the use of an, a combination of a techniques, which includes electron microscopy, crystallography, and the computational biology to understand how the virus enter or attach the host cell and subsequent entry. We all know that today we are having a various different types of vaccines which is available in the market and uh, showing a potential uh, inhibition from the different viruses. Um, like it could be in a Pfizer, Novex, or AstraZeneca, or in India we have um, uh, COVID shield or COVAX or something like that. Uh, basically, whatsoever, there are two types of vaccines. One is in viral vaccines and another one is in RNA vaccines. But some vaccines like in Novax has in different types of vaccines called um, in nanoparticles. Whatsoever, all viruses are, is engage the host cell using their own spike protein. The spike protein is called in the coronavirus but if it is in a HIV, it is called as a hemagglutinin, or influenza is called as a hemagglutinin as well. But what its names are different within a composition of a protein and others. So it's basically in a structural protein called outer spike protein. So that is the one which is going to elicit a, a huge immune response. Um, although we have uh, vaccines available in the market, so we still have an, a big question whether this vaccines can protect us from the different variants of the viruses. Like we have a Delta variant, Lambda variant, or UK variant, so many variants of the mutations are going to happen. Um, so I will answer that question later, whether yes or no. And before that, although the vaccine going to protect the non-infected people, uh, we need a medicine to cure or treat the infected people as well. So as we know that as several millions of people got infected today and we are all in search of a therapeutics or a drugs in addition to having a very, very potential vaccine. I don't want to discuss what is the source of a virus whatsoever. We are the victims now. And, and in general terms, when we look at the virus entry in a textbook in a simplified diagram, a virus attaches in a host cell receptor is something is present on the cell, which triggers an alarm so that it enters the host cell eventually and makes a, a number of viral particles and releases. However, it's not so simple in reality. 
when you look at the a more complex image of the uh, the textbook diagram, uh, still a virus can engage or involve in interaction with the different types of any host cell components, and that entry can also lead into subsequent processing, and a multi-step process is carried over to have a release of the new viral particles. But in every bit of the step, you can have an ability to block the infection. So, um, of course, these uh, drugs, whatever it is, they're chemostat, arbidol, remdesivir, so they all can use to block at different stages, but not at the entry stage. So like a remdesivir cannot block at the entry stage, but chemostat can be blocked. Or other drugs can be blocked, or arbidol <clears throat> can be used to block the entry stage. So each drug has different purposes also. So one drug cannot um, uh, completely kill, or inhibit the viral entry into this human cell. Um, although there are so many structures of individual proteins of the virus of the spike, uh, SARS-2 has been discovered, but the question remains same that the what happening between the junction between the viral protein and the human cell that still has an, a, a lot of study to undergo. So if you look at an electron microscopy image, when virus is attaching to the human cell membrane, it's a portion of a human cell membrane, you'll see it's engaging with a host cell membrane where it has an, a, several types of an, a receptors. But in the SARS-1 and SARS-2, SARS-1, which is going, has infected in 2007 and 6, and SARS-2, the virus, the, the relative observed mode of infection looks relatively similar. But of course, there is a receptor a difference which we cannot elucidate at this kind of a resolution. We need a further resolution um, to see the uh, virus and the protein and protein interactions. So in that regard, we need to go higher resolution, not just a, a superficial electron microscopy. We need a cryo-electron microscopy where you are going to see at single atom resolution, either using the electron microscopy of or as well as a crystallography of individual proteins. So in reality, in one cell could be affected with in a hundreds or thousands of viruses. Like here you see in a, a dendritic cell, which is a colored in orange, is infected with hundreds of viruses. So in that case, a question comes is whether only one receptor is present on the cell to receive the virus and subsequent entry. It has a role, but not always the same. But when you look at here, a one a vesicle of the virus which has entered, more than 15 viruses have been engulfed in one time. So not every virus has utilizing the a, a host cell receptor called as ACE2, which is very well known. Most of the most people know about the ACE2. I don't deny that ACE2 is an important receptor. So I would like to put in a, a simple thing like S2 is like in a main door for entry of a virus. Just like in a thief can enter your home either with the main door or back door from the window or many ways a thief can enter. A virus can also enter the cell, not just by more often a one entry mechanism of kind of an S2. If S2 is the only way the virus can enter, then the drugs which can block the ACE2 would have already resulted in a complete cure of the virus. We don't need to worry anymore, but we still don't have the, any solution for that. So that's why it's also a proof that virals can enter in many different modes of the infection. So just in another uh, electron micrography image to show that virus enters in a many number of viruses are adhered on the cell membrane. They can cascade completely into the host cell and hundreds of virus can infect in single cell also. So today I'm going to just talk about the junction between the virus particle and the human epithelial cells or lung airway cells or lung cells. So what's happening between that junction uh, at an atomic resolution to see how this spike protein going to engage the different host cell receptors, which I'm going to address as a CD26 TMPRSS2 and furin. I'm not much 
highlighting the AS2 because many people already know that AS2 is one of the a key protein for entry. Um, before we want to discover or find out how these protein, how, how this AS2 or the spike protein engages different receptor, first we thought to look for an cryo-electron tomography to see in a different sections or different z-axis or different levels what's inside and outside and how the architecture of the whole virus is made of. So whether the spike protein stays in a single conformation or it is very flexible and moving around and how inside the virus looks like, that can be addressed with an cryo-electron tomography where at the different in, uh, levels of the virus or the section, we can make a slice and image, a slice and image. Something like if you have a, a, a mobile phone and you can have a section at a different level and see what is inside in every different sections of a level. So if I'm just showing in a, this image to, that helps to unravel the inside of the virus, how the a nucleo a protein complex that is in a, a RNA is being engulfed into the virus and outside the spike protein has been sitting there. So let me show the uh, TEM or tomography of the uh, sample. So, um, so when you look at the different, the egg, when the different sections are going to pass from the superficial or surface to the inner dip at the middle of the virus or the depth of the virus, you can visualize. So that helps to understand how exactly in solution live the virus looks like from inside and the outside and how the structure of the spike protein also looks like. Say for example here, um, I'd like to pause here. Um, here you can see the protrusions of, those, uh, of the virus which is there in different conformations or different oscillations is not just sitting as we see in the uh, Destin textbook diagrams. It is very flexible. It can, because it is meant for flexibility so that it can find its target and go and attach and further enter into the human cell. So if you look at in the details of individual ones and then uh, capturing individual pictures, I'm just showing highlighting. So you'll see the dynamic of the uh, individual uh, spike protein, which is so dynamic some are, are blodgy and some are tail like in a long protrusions. So there are different conformations are there. That tells that diversity of the spike protein and which has in a potential to interact with the diversity of the receptors and is very hard to just engage or, uh, or block only the uh, AS2. So if you just put in a, a layman's language in, a, in saying the conformations of the spike protein, we know that the closed conformation, open conformation, when it interacts with the, its receptor and some other different conformation does exist to form an, a stable interaction with the virus. So that if you make an, an, any antibody here and here and here, but actually this can also exist in this conformation called post-fusion conformation. How does that antibody going to work on this one? because it's so dynamic, you are going to block antibody here, but it can, it's already changed the structure. And even the most of the AS2 binds here, but it's different in this conformation. So it's a little bit hard to just target only the receptors, but you need a diversity of the receptors. And I will tell some other catches also. So later, there are several reports has been discovered in June, like it's almost like four or five months after the emergence of the spike protein, there are other possible potential uh, host cell receptors or components can also involve in entry of the viruses, which includes TMPRSS2, CD26, 147, 98, and so many other things. But some are disproved, no, some are shown, yes. So it's all there, it's a proposal, and yes, and some has been proved. So, as I mentioned, we are going to talk about this one. The first and foremost, we want to see, um, we were the first to identify the glycosylation pattern of the virus. So many people um, consider the spike protein, but when you tell the full name is spike glycoprotein. So which means a glycan or a sugar, which is coated on the surface of the protein. So when the sugar or a, 
or a sugar is coated on the protein, it acts as an, a, a, a capsule or an, a, a shield for an, a spike protein so that antibodies do not recognize much of the spike protein. So most of the antibodies interact with the proteins. I don't deny that antibodies don't interact with the sugar, but much weaker affinity and it's most of the antibodies recognize the proteins with a stronger affinity for immune response. So the first and foremost, we identified in February and March saying uh, of 2020 that the main key differences between the SARS-1 and SARS-2 showing the furin cleavage site and the, the RBD or uh, the whole cell receptor binding region are differences. So, and the other portions are relatively consistent. Same color means consistent. So no colored means non-consistent or different with the SARS-1 and SARS-2. Suppose that there was an a, a immediate crystal structure of an ACE2 uh, in complex with the, the human spike. And here SARS-2 virus has been published to show that's in one of the main receptor for SARS-2 entry. But as we know that the uh, spike protein is, is not just in a rigid component like a, what we are seeing in this a rotation model, which is also flexible and rotatable in all directions, which I mentioned in the previous our experiment. So that makes it has a diversity to interact with others, not just with the ACE2 as a one of the protein. So if people do not know how the protein structure looks like in basic terms to say, a protein, any protein in the world can be folded into three different types. One is in a circular spin-like, which I say here, or another is a sheet, like in a amino acids alignment can be in a, like a sheet, which you can see that here in the uh, cyan color or blue color, or it can be coiled, amino acids are going to coil. So that's another way. And another, another way of amino acids of alignment is like in a just linear one after the other, there is no structure is there. Um, that's the three different forms the protein can form. Protein can fold to exhibit a functional subunit of, uh, and uh, the amino acids are going to just arrange. So this is a structure which we resolve using the X-ray crystallography. Um, I don't want to talk about how to solve the, how the X-ray crystallography can tell the protein structure. Um, just to say in a way that this is the, the junction between uh, the spike protein and the ACE2. Say for example, the distance from here to the here, it could be around 15 angstroms. 15 angstroms is, it's, it's very, very tiny. It's definitely can't see with the uh, eye. And the distance between from here the green to the red, the nearest distance is about 2, 2 to 2.5 angstroms where the hydrogen bonds forms. So the extra crystallography can helps to tell the, is basically physics. It tells how the carbon, and if you, re, if in school you guys remember any carbon atom or any atom is resolved by SPD of shells and KLM and shells where the electrons are revolving around the protons uh, uh, on the core of the carbon and they, if they comes in a close vicinity, they share the lone pair of electrons to form a bond. So that's what it is going to be resolved with an extra crystallography to tell the protein-protein interaction. Um, and and first, we first found out how the glycosylation pattern, the sugar pattern, or I can say there's a, a camouflage pattern which is happening between the SARS-2 and the SARS-1. It is very, very important because if the sugar is coated in such a way that and we make an antibodies targeting the sugar coated region, its antibodies are relatively useless. So that's why understanding the a glycosylation pattern of the virus is very important. And as a glycoprotein, it is there. So we have first identified how different SARS-2 and SARS-1 has a glycosylation pattern. That resulted to understand it's a new interaction with another um, a human cell receptor called as CD26. 
or CD is named as cell determining factor called 26 or it has an, another name called as DPPP4 or also called as dipeptidyl phosphatase is an extracellular protein on the human epi lung epithelial cell which acts as a phosphatase where the protein recognizes this and further process and then enter uh, into the human cell. I mean, the spike protein recognizes this. Um, if you are a structural biologist or a protein chemist, you may understand that these numbers uh, is means that, I mean, assets of individual uh, spike protein and as well as the, the CD26 going to interact either with a hydrogen bonding, Van der Waals force of interaction, or hydrophobic interactions is different. So it's a basically showing that is an interaction interface where it attaches and enter into the cell. In basically, this is a spike protein attaches to the human CD26 and pulls into the cell. So as I mentioned, the diversity and as well as flexibility of the spike protein so it is very flexible when it moves to different direction to receive the, uh, the host cell receptors and then for subsequently enter. So that was in the early March 2020 and within a month we got a number of citations and um, uh, it has been highlighted in many places to say one of the possible target and uh, mouse models has been developed both for the AS2 and TPP4 and to knock out mouse or mouse studies to infect the virus to test whether it can um, promisingly affect or not. So that was in a one lineage to start with in a possible C26 as a new uh, a target for an spike SARS-2 for viral entry. In the meantime, it was um, interesting for us to know that the influenza virus, which is known for in a common cold, or there are so many influenza viruses are there, hundreds, I can say that H1N1, H3, N2 are so many are there. They're all going to cause any lung infections, pneumonia, cough, cold, sorry, cold and uh, a breathing problem and all the things, which has some relevance with the uh, COVID-19 symptoms also. So when we looked at the uh, core portion of the hemagglutinin, as I mentioned, the different viruses has a spike protein they call as some proteins called as an hemagglutinin. They have a conserved region. Conservative region means the amino acid pattern between the influenza virus and the COVID-19 virus has same. What does it mean? If it is same means there is a possibility of the same drug which can help to reduce the infection of influenza may work as well as in the case of the uh, SARS-2 virus also. So, when we looked at the possibility of the binding, we did in a cell-based uh, assays in a cell line to test whether it can, the, this drug called as an arbidol, which can bind and inhibit the uh, viral replication. And we found that, yes, arbidol does bind to the cells and inhibit uh, compared to another drugs called as galaxivir, lemonavir, paravir, or ostelavir, or other drugs but it does have some cytotoxicity, which means like some cells are dying when we treat the high concentrations of arbidol to the cells. So then the question comes is, is it safe to take that arbidol? Um, then the question was, yes, we were not sure whether it is to be used for um, a COVID-19 cases, but of course the survival is better than having some sickness that was a major concern. Of course, this was in March or April, and definitely there was no vaccine, no potential drug. So a trial of any different drugs was very, very important for uh, understanding. So when we look at the uh, structure of how the drug binding in the spike protein of the virus, it perfectly fits into the uh, spike protein and inhibit the uh, viral um, attachment. So it's very hard to understand and I like to explain in a very simple way. The spike protein is made of three a, a proteins. It's called as three monomer proteins, which is colored in three colors, green, pink, and gray. So what does it do is drug go and interfere 
like a two proteins to be present in a very close vicinity to it functionally active what is happening is a drug is coming and entering in between the two proteins and it's going to break the interaction interface so now these two proteins cannot interact and it will fall apart when they fall apart they're functionally not active that's what we show in a, fun a molecular dynamics to show they can fall apart when the drug has bound so in a better way to understand let's have a small video to see how this drug intercalate or enter the spike protein and block and inhibit the virus um, so this is spike protein one monomer this is trimer and the drug binds and when the drug binds and it causes an asteric hindrance and it cannot stabilize the protein and it will break apart in the the green and the other color will separate out and it functionally active so this is all good within a structural studies then then the proof of concept is could be fine but we have to know whether this is really true with the patients so then we collaborate with the uh, Wuhan Pulmonary Hospital in China, where the main hospital, where the first outbreak has happened. So we had about uh, 500 patients who are suffering with COVID-19 and who has the symptoms of uh, all the COVID-19. And we treat them with the three different drugs, of course, along with the Arbidol as well. So in simple way to tell, uh, I'm just showing the very, very raw data to, to show is not manipulated data. Of course, the names are being uh, blocked. Um, sorry for the Mandarin language, which uh, uh, we use. Um, the left side panel, where the patient was infected and came to the hospital and showed the infection, which is a patch here, you can see that. That was on 9th February, 2020. You can clearly see there's so much of the a, a white patch is is all the a lump of the virus which is uh, happening. So the Arbidol treatment on 19th February, that is 10 days of a treatment, a huge amount of this, the viral viruses lumps has been clear, showing that uh, one of the potential, um, a drug to clear the infection in patients. So along with that, we did in a long, long row studies of with the many patients with the different drugs like Arbidol only, Arbidol with other drug combinations to see which is better, which is not better and combinations. Of course, Arbidol with Ostalivir has shown a little bit better effect compared to Arbidol only uh, treated patients saying that combination of the drugs could be def definitely is useful. And here also you can see that day one of the infection with the after the some treatment, it has reduced but not cleared, but subsequently longer rate of a treatment, it has cleared the virus. Um, not everyone can clear with the 10 days, but it depends upon the load of virus they have, level of infection they have, they all matters. And also we see the death rate in those patients are being reduced tremendously. So the another important factor which was saying is in a furine, which we discovered like, um, there is an furine cleavage site in the SARS-CoV-2, which makes the spike protein to cut into two halves. That was first be um, identified on the solid structure of uh, uh, SARS-2 spike protein in complex with the uh, furine protein. i uh, sorry about the too much of uh, structural information. And uh, when it cuts the spike protein, it becomes a two pieces. One is a fusion protein, and this is a protein which binds to the uh, AC2 or other protein. It's an gel picture showing that when the full length of the spike protein cut, it becomes S1 and S2, where it will be separated into the two halves. Showing that if S2 going to bind here, then it is going to get cut, and it will be separated into two pieces. Then what is the use of an S2? Yes, it can help to uh, minimize but not exactly completely block the uh, viral entry so we also see that it's uh, if the spike protein is cleaved with the furin is not cleared with the furin and cleaved with the furin we'll see the dynamic motion of the virus spike protein how dynamic it is that the left side is a non-cleaved and right side is a cleaved so when you look at it's more motion you see in the in the spike protein. So in the right side, which says that 
the more motion is more easy to get separated. So that's a one way and it get cleaved and then further functionally infect the other cells. So in the, in the, in simple way to see a, a three dimensional spike protein is going to uh, first attack by the furin protease and the at the region of S1 and S2 binding region. So when the furin is going to attack that region, uh, of course, three proteins, three furins are there, and they going to have a, a strong interaction interface because the protease, it will cut the virus into two halves. So uh, let's show. So when it cuts, this the gray part and the colored part will separate it. So that makes the spike protein is a new thing. So what makes this more important? Something like a spike protein is like an say, is in Santa Claus. So a Santa Claus is coming with an, a Santa Claus dress and uh, with a lot of makeup and you can't and enter the cell. And body thinks like, wow, okay, there is a Santa Claus and I have to make an antibodies and other things to kill the Santa Claus. But the moment it enters, it cuts the spike protein into two different pieces. It's something like it strip its dress. So now there is no Santa Claus in the cell. So it's something like you can't find it. It's different guy is there. So it escaped the immune system there. That's the one of the way the SARS spike protein is also escaping the immune system. There's so many ways. One is a glycosylation where the sugar is going to shell it. Second is it is going to have the stripping or cutting the spike protein uh, into two halves by the furin. And there are so many ways. And we also have a different drugs which can block the SARS-2 and uh, human uh, furin interaction, which is uh, basically called as an amber compounds, which binds at a very strong affinity with the drug. And uh, the last one I want to just touch upon in a very brief way um, which we collaborated with India because we found an interesting thing in India is many patients or many people, although infected with uh, um, COVID-19, they are fine. I mean, they are not too much sick and some are, of course, sick and passed away. I, my deep condolences and regret for that. And the infection rate, the severity was not that high compared to uh, Caucasian background or European background, I can say that. So that was very interesting to see what is happening in Indian population, why they are a little bit resistant compared to the uh, non-Indian background or in a white background or in a Caucasian background. So we did almost like in a 270 Indian people who showed the uh, mild and the severe infections. We did an, a deep sequencing of their genome to know what is the mutation change has happened. So basically the host or our mutations, our gene mutations in our cell can result in a stability or protection against the virus. So we found one mutation called as V162M. So valine in 162 methionine has been changed in majority of the Indian populations. So how does it help? So when that mutation happened, the infection, rate has severely different if it is a not in fact not mutating or a mutant so the infection rate in the human patients we see is very different or very less number of cells or is infection was very mild this is an a very very less non symptomatic a symptomatic but very mild infections and severe infections with no mutations so then the question comes is well, that mutation is going to cause more severe infection in humans than how it is going to work. So we always like to put in a question like how, why, and where. So that was gives in a very a fundamental answers to know how this going to function and cascade into for the a principal function. Again, we use an a structural biology approach because a structural biology is one of the perfect and powerful tool to see at the atomic resolution at what one individual amino acid is doing, how that amino acid is going to change the a complete phenomena of the infection. So if you look at the top two panels, so that's a wild type, 
that is where the green amino acid is the valine, which is going to, which is a native amino acid is present. So when valine is changed to methionine, if that is an yellow part, which I uh, highlighted, if I put in a force field change, so, and it completely push the protein in different conformation. Say for example, here, the greenish, green color and blue color is it, blue color is the wild type or the, the natural one. If we have an Indian people has a mutation in valine to, to methionine, you, you see the structurally completely different. You can see the B and D, if they look completely different in the protein. When the protein structure differs, its way to interact with the spike protein also differs and reduces. So we also see in the uh, histology experiment and as well as a cleavage experiment, like how the spike can cleave between the wild type or the wild type in the sense a native people and as well as the mutant people. We see when the mutation happens, the spike cleavage is reduced. When spike cleavage is reduced, you will see still the same a thief or a bad guy, the police, that's the antibodies can or other immune factors can still recognize. So you were avoiding or reducing a Santa Claus is converting or stripping his dress. That's what is going to happen in most of the uh, Indian population where the mutation is happening. But of course, not everyone, every Indian ethnic background has a mutation, but it depends. So who has a mutation is the gain advantage. A similar kind of a phenomena is there in, in different countries and different ethnic background. The genetic mutations are going to help them to um, resistant. A classical example is sickle cell anemia. They don't get malaria because the blood cells are different because of the mutation. So a single mutation we think, single amino acid is a huge. A single amino acid change will change our color. Single amino acid will change our eye color, skin color, hair color, lactose tolerance, lactose intolerance, and so many diseases and disorders in the human are happens with a single amino acid change also. So that gives an example to say that um, that one single mutation has changed the infection rate in, in a large bit of a population, whoever, not just an Indian, of course, other country people does have this kind of a mutation. They show the difference in the infection rate. Um, of course, we saw the structure of a TMPRSS2 interaction with the spike protein to show how this spike protein are going to interact with the TMPRSS2 and for the subsequent entry of the virus. And uh, um, that helps to understand the, the interaction interface mechanism of the, how the SARS-2 engages TMPRSS2, furine, ACE2, and CD26 for subsequent infection and enter into the cells. Um, we also found some drugs which can block for the TMPRSS2 so that you can inhibit the cleavage of the spike protein that helps to block the uh, or reduce the viral infection also. Some of these four drugs are the upmostat, nafmostat, and uh, uh, chemostat, methylase, and bromoxyhexane are the four major drugs. Um, but chemostat methylase is one of the most potential one is many clinical trials are being still undergoing to see efficacy in patients as well. Uh, in, in summary, the, the spike protein is made of a three monomers, which assemble to form a virulent, uh, functionally active spike protein, which can be blocked using an orbital. And orbital, when this can block the trimerization, can also inhibit the interaction with the ACE2 or CD26. Even it happens, you can block this uh, interaction or further cascade happening using an AMBA compound where the furin is going to cleave or using the TMPRSS2 uh, blockers called chemostat and nefmostat, which makes a uh, completely block uh, the viral entry sort of, like you can use a combination, three drugs can helpful. So in the last, this is an, a, a spike protein and the gray color is the um, a glycosylation or a sugar which is surrounded. And if you look at when interact with the human cell, how vibrantly they behave um, is here. So this is a functionally active protein and when they found 
or interact with the human cell. It could be an ACE2 or anything. So they get cleaved with another thing and then it has a different conformation and they attach the cell and completely makes the cargo to dock onto the human cell membrane. So brings the cell, cell fusion is one of the mechanism where uh, enters or engulf into the cell. But this all happens in just a glimpse of an eye. Um, so this was in a, a video uh, I'm adopted from the McGrill um, place. This was a very beautiful video I would like to share, uh, which they have. And uh, with this, I thank uh, Monash University, Wuhan Pulmonary Hospital and other hospitals in China and Japan for collaboration. And of course, the Indian hospital in Hyderabad, which we have collaborated. Uh, thanks for talking a little bit longer and happy to take questions. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for your valuable time. Uh, thank you. And your advice and guidance is definitely going to work for our students. Uh, I have got two questions uh, for yeah. you from our students. Yeah. Uh, they are more important in knowing about you than the oh, okay. uh, SARS virus. Sure. So the first two uh, question I have got from the student, right. which is the most challenging issue that you have faced while doing your research? Uh, cultural shock and um, the cultural environment. Um, I moved from India to Taiwan to do my PhD. I was decided I have to do PhD overseas, not in India, for some reasons. And uh, when I moved, of course, it's in a Mandarin or a Chinese-speaking environment. So a little bit tough, but eventually I learned Mandarin by attending the classes. So then it was fine. And uh, that was one challenge. And the second challenge with uh, academically is when you don't get the results what you want okay. so it is frustrating depressing uh, we lose a motivation and i should say thanks to my supervisors my boss and my boss wife they were both were professors so they were very encouraging and uh, supported to explain the stuff that's pretty good um, um yeah yeah no road is smooth i can say that sorry <laughs> uh, Yes, sir. Uh, there is one more question from a yeah. student, Aman. Uh, what piece of advice would you like to give our PG and UG students of our university who wants to make their career in the same field? So okay. What do you want to suggest to them? Okay, same field in the sense structural biology, if yes, I understand. Yes, yes. Right. Um, either UG or PG, um, is definitely is in a very novice stage. You can learn as much as you know about the structure of biology, about um, what you can learn, that's fine. But I understand the research and uh, um, coursework difference is there. Like and there is an MSc and MS's difference is there. So people with MS has a research background. They have, they have exposure to the practical hands-on experience using all these uh, techniques and the tools to work in a lab. But if you are in MSc, you do not have an access to these facilities. So learn whatever you can and uh, go to the place where you have these facilities to learn and work on it. Um, I understand some of the facilities may be quite expensive, so not every place may not have. So it's no need to you should that every university should have all the facilities um say in a simple example is uh, if you don't have something just go and ask i would like to use can i or uh, or in, in other words in academically we say can we collaborate or this is my project this is my thing this is my uh, proposal and i want to do this bit of a study we do not have a facility so we want we want to approach you to accommodate for that facility. Either they do that part, maybe you know, they may not allow you to do, but you can say, I'm happy to learn something what I can. That's what you have to come through. 
um, I understand most of the institutes or uh, universities now having the uh, electron microscopy and uh, extra crystallography facility, I think so, but depends. Um, or else the best option is have a PhD where you world, world class facility you will find. Go there, do the PhD there. Yeah. Definitely. Thank you so much, sir. You are an inspiration and motivation to many of our undergraduate and graduate students. And I no believe worries. all the participants have gained in depth knowledge by taking this lecture. So I would like to pay my sincere gratitude to Naveen, sir. Uh, and uh, for, thank you so much, sir, for delivering such an informative and interesting session about the discussing over the structural and functional mechanism of SARS-CoV-2 in engaging varied host and cell factors for activation and entry potential drug strategy for combat. We are very much grateful for the time and effort you took to share your stimulating knowledge, thoughts and experience with us. I would like to thank Dr. Giri sir, HOD of Life Science Department of Parul University for providing this opportunity for arranging this webinar for all of us. I would like to thank our students, participants, and all the faculty members for joining this live webinar and being so interactive. Once again, thank you so much. Have a great, nice day, sir. Thank, thank you, you very much. Have a good day.